had one lecture, you remember, by Professor Srinivas Reddy about the Portuguese travelers to India. So every kind of travelers give us one more perspective or kind of perception, which is different according to the nation they come from. Um, the French travelers have a distinct uh, kind of attitude, uh, which is <clears throat> very different from the attitude of the British travelers, for example, on the whole. And I'll be giving you some, some examples, of course, as we go along. So I thought it would be a nice supplement to the course. And um, I could not do a, a proper comparative study of French versus British travelers. But I think you can read between the lines if you are used to a little bit of travelers' literature, you know, travelers' accounts, uh, and also the accounts of the early col colonial officers. So you get a very different tone altogether. <coughs> now, <coughs> before I begin, can you tell me why should people leave the comfort of their homes in France or in Britain or whatever and come all the way to India in the 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th century, which is far away, of course. It's a difficult voyage on the sea. And, and um, uh, there are lots of diseases, contagious diseases. And in fact, we, there are a number of travelers who died on the way or died in India could never return home. So there is a fairly high risk involved. It's not like, you know, jumping into a, a plane. Uh, uh, or so how, why, what exactly is the motivation for them? Would you like to suggest some answers? What do you think could, yeah. So spirit of adventure uh, is one but let me tell you, this is the last motivation. There are far more powerful motivations at work before that. Money to get riches, because India has a reputation for being a land with fabulous riches. So let's go and see whether we can make our fortune. That is one powerful motivation. You would like to suggest something? Some, that was that? There are other reasons. At least two I can think of and which we will see actually at work. There are actually two, three. Well, one which goes with wealth is fame because this is the time of where there are still large portions of the world which are not explored, right? So even though <clears throat> India is not an altogether unknown region of the world, still it is poorly known, it is mysterious, it is exotic. And therefore, if you can travel and come back and publish an account of your travels, you have a chance, if you can make it interesting enough, you get a chance of acquiring some fame. And uh, this was one motivation, certainly, because you find hundreds of travelers' accounts, hundreds, most of which are of very low value. Very low because this is just like journalism today. You want to make it a little sensational so that the book will sell. It is the same in those days. And therefore, you spice it up. So you spice it up by <clears throat> either you know, dramatizing things, or you spice it up by inventing altogether, which some travelers did. So, so this is the second motivation. What else? I, I, I can't hear properly. Uh, can we just, you keep a mic among yourselves. Keep it among yourselves, and because we are not a big crowd today. And um, 
to run away from uh, domestic persecution? That will be a rare case. As in, uh, it did happen once in a while. It did happen. Um, you know that Australia was colonized largely by convicts. But in the case of France, I can't immediately remember such a case. So what else? What, why would you go to some other land? Today, Call why would you travel today to some other land? For trade purpose? Evangelical mission? Sorry, sorry, yes? For trade purpose? I can't hear properly. Trade, trade. Trade, yes. Well, trade is part of the first answer Ambarish gave. Riches, to get richer. And of course, usually trade is the, unless you are planning to indulge in looting, Trade is normally the way to get richer. So there's another answer, very important, Colonize. which we're going to see today. Uh, evangelical mm -hmm. missions. Evangelical missions. Yes, evangelical missions, proselytizing, missionaryism is one big motivation. But there is still one more, which you are all missing. And the answer is to get knowledge. For knowledge, just knowledge. Knowledge of many things. It can be, <clears throat> it can be knowledge of, let us say, India's geography, India's climate, India's uh, uh, um, um, fauna and flora. And we will see one case today. It can be also knowledge of India's religions. And this, in the case of the French travelers, happened to be a powerful motivation. To discover the ancient texts of India, to f compare them with those of Christianity, to, in other words, to discover another civilization. Just as Egypt was being also uh, studied by huge numbers of, of European scholars, not only for the decipherment of the hieroglyphs, but to understand everything about you know, Egyptian dynasties and uh, um, architecture and whatever else. So for knowledge, to understand the, the, the civilization which is there. So you can see that there are many different motivations at work. And I think we're going to kind of cover all of them today. So. <clears throat> I begin, my choice is a bit arbitrary. I'm just taking something a little bit representative. And uh, I could have taken one or two earlier ones, but Pirard de Laval was among the very earliest in the uh, early 17th century. And you can see here, you can see, OK, let me try on this screen how leaving France, they had to circumnavigate Africa because there was no Suez Canal. So no shortcut. It's a very long journey. And then he will land, I think he will uh, land in Madagascar and um, what is known today as the Reunion and, and a few more. And then the Maldives and finally India and the western coast of India, <clears throat> essentially, essentially Kerala, the Kerala coast. So Pirard de Laval was therefore a first-rate navigator. And he published this book, which luckily is available in English translation. Um, not many of the books are of the works of the travelers we will see today. Not too many of them are available in English. Most are not. And this is the voyage of François Pirard of Laval to the East Indies. East Indies means India in those days. You had the East Indies and you had the West Indies. You know the reason, of course. Why do we have East and West Indies? Uh, yeah, the mic, please. Mike. Yeah, Columb Hello? Columbus thought that it was India as he was going the exactly. West. Exactly. Because Columbus misnamed the first American islands he came across, 
as being India, part of India. So that remained, the, st the name stuck, and it is still the West I Indies. But in India, of course, East Indies, the term was abandoned later. The Maldives, the Moluccas, and Brazil. That's, of course, another story. So that was published in France in 1610, <coughs> I think. And he will be visiting mostly along, among other parts. He will be visiting Calicut in Kerala. And he will spend some, most of his time in Kerala. So this is, I'm sorry, this is an image of the port of Calicut a little before Pirard de Laval visited it, but it gives you a kind of a <coughs> an impression. Uh, you can see different kind of kinds of boats. There are big sailing ships with uh, with you know um, uh, with masts and so on, and you have much smaller fishing ships. You can see the fishing nets. Fishing nets are here, for example. And uh, you can see also ship building here. There is a, here a group of people building ships. Uh, you have, of course, an elephant. And what do you see here? What is this? Can you make out from where you sit? It's a church. So there is already a church because Christians are already settled. And, um, and I will tell you briefly how it happens. So let me just read. Uh, today there are lots of texts which I have to read out because these are their testimonies. Calicut, I have preserved the archaic spellings most of the times. Huh? So these are not spelling mistakes, but that's the way they used to spell those names. Calicut is the busiest town and most full of traffic and commerce in the whole of India. It has merchants from all parts of the world and of all nations and religions by reason of the liberty and security accorded to them there. For the king, the king of Calicut, permits, the, permits for the exercise of every kind of religion and yet it is strictly forbidden to talk, dispute, or quarrel on that subject. So there never arises any contention on that score, everyone living in great liberty of conscience under the favor and authority of the king, who holds that to be a cardinal maxim. Cardinal maxim means a fundamental principle of, the go of government with a view to making his kingdom very rich and of great intercourse. So what exactly is happening here? The king is accepting all religions. There's absolutely no bar. But he forbids any talk about this religion, which means, obviously, they must have already had some negative experience that when people start talking religion, you know, things degenerate. So therefore, to maintain law and order, no discussion no religious discourse, and therefore you will have more peace. If by chance there should arise any difference or disturbance on that subject, he who began it would receive corporal punishment as being guilty of treason without hope of pardon or remission of sentence. This is why everyone lives here in great peace and concord, notwithstanding the great diversity of races and religions of the inhabitants and of strangers and sojourners. For besides the native Gentiles and Mohammedans, there are many Christians. What does Gentiles mean? Gentile is a word which in a Christian context means pagans. That is to say, not those who are, who are not um, who do not have a, what is known as the religion of the book. That is to say, those who do not have the Bible or the Quran. So they are those who are neither Jew, Jewish, nor Christian, nor Muslim. This is what Gentile means. 
in the Christian context, in other contexts, it can have different meanings. So therefore, we can see that already this is, this is uh, more than 400 years ago. 400 years ago, you have already Calicut as a very cosmopolitan place with already a great mix because the Portuguese had already come by. You have a great mix of different um, populations and religions and cultures. And he continues, and now he's speaking about the Zamorin, as the British called, called him, of Calicut, the ruler, which is a distortion of a, a Malayalam word, which is Samutri, of Korikod. This prince, when I was there, was about 50 years of age and had reigned about 35 years, which means that he began his rule when he was 15. He's handsome, tall, and erect, nimble, slim, and well-proportioned in limb. He loves his people and is beloved and obeyed by them, feared and dreaded by his neighbors and enemies. He has but one wife, like the other Brahmani Nayas, and at this time had no children. <clears throat> When he travels, he does so with a very great company, having always about 3,000 men in his following. He rides upon an elephant, of which animals he has a great number. Wherever he passes, all assemble in arms to accompany him, in so much that sometimes he has more than 10,000 persons around him. His principal seat is at Calicut, where he has a very handsome and well-built palace, all enclosed with good walls and moats, with drawbridge to the gates and water all around in the moats. A large number of soldiers day and night guard the gates, which are four in number. They admit no one unless he is well known, nor such a one without questioning him. And he goes on and on, detailing the various security barriers, as we would call them today, that a visitor has to pass before he can reach the king. So the king apparently is very well protected, which means that there is a certain threat perception. And in fact, there was warring between neighboring, uh, neighboring Kerala uh, kingdoms. <clears throat> now, I leave Pirard de Laval to move on to the 18th century travelers who um, are the most important ones um, uh, to consider in, in this presentation because there we have a systematic exploration of what India really is. So this is the French philosopher Voltaire. That's the second time we meet him. I had briefly quoted him in my first talk on, uh, on um, history, in fact. And Voltaire did not travel to India. He never traveled beyond Europe. But he was extremely interested in India, extremely interested. For a reason I will tell you in a minute, but you can try to guess it. There is a, a, a very strong motivation for him to study India. So he says, and he wrote a little book called Fragments of Indian History in 1773, which is available in a fairly bad English translation. And uh, this book is actually a very interesting little essay with a lot of uh, um, uh, speculations because it doesn't have very reliable data to build it upon. But very interesting thoughts about India. And most of these quotations come from there. No sooner did India begin to be known to the Occident's barbarians who is he talking about? Who are the Occident's barbarians? Yeah, the Europeans. The Europeans of the colonial age. He calls them barbarians. That already shows a certain line of thought. And even more so when these barbarians, once they had become civilized and industrious, created new needs for themselves, new needs, new markets. As is well enough known, hardly had Europeans sailed past the seas around the south and east of Africa 
when they wage battle against 20 peoples of India, for example, in Bengal, in South India, in Kerala, in Goa, and so on and so forth, of whose existence we had so far been ignorant. So we went there and we started wars against people whom, whose existence we did not even know. The Albuquerques, this is after, that means the, simply speaking the Portuguese. Um, the, after one Portuguese viceroy who had this name, the Albuquerques and their successors succeeded in supplying Europe with pepper and paintings only through carnage. He continues, we have shown how much we surpass the Indians in courage and wickedness and how inferior to them we are in wisdom. So in other words, we were able to conquer India, he says, because we were more aggressive, right? But not because we were wiser. Our European nations have mutually destroyed themselves in this land because it's not only that Europeans fought Indians, they fought themselves in India. You may remember the wars between the French and the British. There were also confrontations with the Dutch, sometimes the Portuguese, and so on. Destroyed themselves in this land where we only go in search of money, while the first Greeks travel to the same land only to instruct themselves. Is that statement correct? The last statement, is it correct? The Kushanas? Kushanas? The kings which came from... Okay, the Greeks traveled to India long back and they came and settled here and they... Yes, from, from, from Indians they learned and they got instructions. Yeah, but actually that was not the more primary motivation for Greeks to come. The Greeks came as a sequel of Alexander the Great's campaign. It was sheer military conquest, which was the initial motivation. So yes, afterwards there were cultural interchanges, I mean interactions, <coughs> which did enrich both cultures, but this is a little bit romanticized. You see, he's exaggerating the contrast between the Greek uh, invasions of India and the French ones. Uh, excuse me, the, yeah, the European ones. Any if India, this is a very strange statement, if India, whom the whole earth needs, and who alone needs no one. So he says, Voltaire, that the whole world needs India, but India doesn't need anyone. If it must by that very fact be the most anciently civilized land, she must therefore have had the most ancient form of religion. Now, can you begin to guess? I, I told you the previous slide, Voltaire had a special motivation in studying India. Can you begin to guess what it might be with this sentence? Anyone? Ambarish, unless you want to. Uh, so I am hazarding a guess. Uh, yeah. Was uh, Voltaire, uh, I, actually I'm uh, confused between Voltaire and the uh, other French Enlightenment, uh, uh, Rousseau. So yes, so, so was Voltaire a clergyman? So that's the first question. No, 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 we are only talking about Voltaire. Yes. Uh, because Rousseau had no interest in India that I can remember. But Voltaire had a very passionate interest okay. and wrote a lot about India, not only in this book, but in several others. Yes, his primary... Uh, reason for making this particular statement was uh, to compare uh, the oriental religion with uh, Christianity. And exactly. Christianity's supposed uh, uh, dominance at that point of time at, as it being the most evolved form of religion. Exactly. Fairly precisely. You got it. 
Voltaire was part of the Enlightenment movement. He was among the prominent philosophers in the age of Enlightenment who sought to undermine the power of Christianity. Political power, religious power, religious influence, and basically to show the absurdity of many of the Christian beliefs. And therefore, one way to do that, there were many other ways, but one way to do that was to study more ancient civilizations than the Judeo-Christian, right? Like, for example, the Egyptian civilization, as I told you, was beginning to be known. And now the Indian civilization was kind of emerging from, you know, a fog, as it were, a, a fog of mystery. And, and he tried to show that even before Christianity, there was wisdom, there were systems of beliefs, there was civilization in other worlds. So that is his line. He continues, we confess with regret that when trying to know the true history of this nation, India, its government, its religion and, and customs, we have found the compilations of our French authors to be of no help. The writers who transcribe fables for booksellers, you remember I told you about those who wanted quick fame uh, by exploring India a little bit and publishing sensational accounts when they came back. Our missionaries and our travelers have almost never told us the truth. So this is a very damning statement, which was partly true in Voltaire's time. However, some of the major French travelers whom we are going to see, and who were in India at that time when he was writing, he didn't have access to their accounts as yet. So, so we, we can understand to some extent, but it also shows us that just, before you have a just because you have a traveler's account, it doesn't mean that you can you know, uh, um, take it all as trustworthy. There may be fabrications, there may be misunderstandings, there may be prejudices, and therefore it requires a lot of care to handle this kind of material. So this is from his book in 1773, Historical Fragments on India. Now I move briefly to two Jesuit fathers, uh, the, the, least, uh, the lesser, one, lesser known of the two is Father Pons, uh, who was stationed at Chandanagar and later on Karekal, and who wrote uh, here in 1740, you can see the date, it is a letter from Father Pons, missionary in the company of Jesus, that is to say the Jesuits, to another father of the same company, and it is dated Karekal, uh, 23rd November 1740. And in this letter, it's a long letter and quite amazingly pioneering because the common, no, the, the received wisdom is that in those days, nobody among the foreign visitors to India was able to understand Sanskrit. And that William Jones, in something like 1786, the date comes later. William Jones was the first European to master Sanskrit and write about Sanskrit uh, in Calcutta and translate the first Sanskrit text. Well, it's not true. There were many Jesuits, in fact, and a few couple of other scholars who had already mastered Sanskrit, but they did not translate Sanskrit text to make them available to Europe. However, in this letter, which is a long one, he gives a fairly good description of the Sanskrit language, its grammar, its structure, and an overview of the Sanskrit literature, the Vedas, the Upanishads, the two epics, the Puranas, all of it is described there with some errors here and there, but broadly speaking, it's, it's correct. And also, the main schools of Indian philosophy. The, the Vedantic schools, the Mimansa, the Nyaya, the school of logic, and so on and so forth. So quite a remarkable account for this period of time. And this leads me to mention that 
it is thanks to the Jesuits that the first manuscripts of the Veda, the Rig Veda in particular, had already reached the French Royal Library in 1731. It was written in Grantha script. Grantha script is a South Indian script uh, specially adapted to the writing of Sanskrit. Some of the letters are still in use in even today's uh, Tamil script. And, and this was the complete manuscript of the Rig Veda. However, however, nobody knew that this was the Rig Veda because in Paris, nobody could read these manuscripts. And in fact, people were beginning to hear about this Veda, Veda as the Tamil, I mean, the, the Indian Bible. But nobody had seen it. And the irony is that many of the travelers we are going to see in particular, the next one, I think, after these, uh, the second Jesuit, went to India actually to hunt for the Veda, to discover that mysterious ancient text of India through which they were hoping that India could finally be understood. And nobody realized that this text was lying in Paris all this time. So there's an irony there. And this is the work of the Jesuits who collected hundreds of manuscripts and kept shipping them to Paris. But most of the time, they could not read those manuscripts, and they weren't sure what they really contained. So it was a kind of a, you know, blind collection. The second Jesuit I want to mention is Father Coeur Doux. Now, Coeur Doux in French means gentle heart or soft heart. And you will see that he he's not, doesn't exactly deserve that name. You will see why in a moment. So again, we are in the 18th century. And uh, Kurdu um, uh, contributed a lot to European knowledge about India in many ways. First of all, he lived in South India for 47 years. That's a long time. He composed the very first uh, Telugu Sanskrit dictionary with French attached. So it was an opening for you know, much of Europe. Because remember that French in those days was the lingua franca of the cultured European intelligentsia. You know, no European scholar uh, could call himself a scholar without knowing French. It was impossible. Till the 19th, even early 20th century, this was the case. Cardou also sent memoirs. That is to say, kind of what we, call, what we would call today a memorandum, if you like, to the French Academy where he actually, in, nine, in 1767, he demonstrated through a method which was fairly good, almost as good as what would be a modern linguistic method, comparison of roots of words, the similarity between Sanskrit, Latin, Greek, German, and Russian. He knew all those languages. And he was able to show that they were basically all cousin languages, or somehow related. And this is very uh, pioneering. In fact, William Jones will do the same, will make the same statement. And uh, he has some very famous um, praise of Sanskrit, uh, which he did at the Asiatic Society uh, almost 10 years later. So 20 years, 20 years later. So uh, Father Cardou, therefore, was a pioneer. Unfortunately, this was not very much noticed. And uh, therefore, for a long time, for a very long time, it is William Jones who uh, cornered the credit of having, for the first time, uh, brought out the notion of an Indo-European family of languages, which is one of the foundations of modern linguistics. So he studied also Indian customs and some technologies, because uh, very often Europeans coming to India were confronted to technologies they didn't know. They were not aware of. They could not understand. So we have quite a lot, and I won't be able to go very much into this today. Uh, you have quite a lot of very interesting information on technologies unknown uh, to, to Europeans. Uh, here. I found a paper by uh, Coeur about 
the how uh, you might remember Voltaire mentioning the Indian paintings which are exported to Europe as something being very precious. The Europeans were very struck by uh, Indian art of painting. Well, he writes a whole paper on how Indian canvases are prepared and how the pigments are also made, extracted for plants, from plants in particular. And it's extremely elaborate. I mean, his description is very, very minutely done. There is an, however, there is the other, the other face of Cordoue, which uh, reminds us of why the Jesuits were in India after all, initially. They didn't come to India to study India. They came to India as part of their mission to Christianize India. And there was no concealment about it. It was perfectly open. But in the process, to be a better missionary, a better proselyte, if you know the local culture, the local language, the local history, and so on, you will be far more effective because you will be able to relate to the people much more efficiently. So that's why they often turned out to be very good students of India at the same time. But not only students. In this case, this is a map dated 1705, 1705 of Pondicherry. So you can see on the right, you can see on the right the European town, I mean the French town, you know, with its uh, rigid grid iron pattern. So that's French, <clears throat> no doubt. And then, the native town is scattered a little bit everywhere around. But here you can't read, but there is a word which reads pagod. What is pagod or pagoda in English? Um, pagoda means, what do you know, anybody knows what is a pagoda? This is the old European term for? It's just for a temple. In those days. Now, we, I think we use the word mostly for Japanese temples, somehow Korean to Japanese. I, I'm not very sure. But uh, in those days, this is, how, this is the word they used to describe Hindu temples, basically. At least in French literature, it is the case. So there is a temple. What is this temple? It was quite famous in its days, and it is the Veda Purishwa temple of Pondicherry, it was a huge temple to Lord Shiva. So that temple happened to be right next to a cathedral which you can see here. And that was the St. Paul's Cathedral, which is still there in Pondicherry. And the Jesuits were bothered. They were bothered that there was a monument to idolatry as, you know, they regarded uh, Hinduism, and uh, sometimes they use very, very strong words to condemn, you know, the, the uh, idolatry of Hinduism and the, uh, uh, all the rituals and practices. And therefore, they asked for permission from King Louis XIV to destroy the temple. Now, Louis XIV gave the permission. However, it was not carried out for a while because for a while the, the French governors didn't want to do it. They didn't want to implement the order because they thought that this will antagonize the population. Why you know, create such a situation? However, and we have that testimony from Ananda Rangapillai, who was a Dubash. What is a Dubash? You can guess. Dubash means two languages, therefore, an interpreter. So Dubash was the official interpreter between the French and the Tamilians. And he left an 11 volume, or 12, I forget, diary, where day after day, so this is one of the most important documents for those who want to study early French India. And uh, he leaves this whole mm. testimony there. Uh, of the destruction of the Veda Purishwa temple. And how did it happen? It happened because one French governor, Duplex, who was among the most uh, famous, I mean, the most studied French governor of the 18th century, had a wife. And his wife was, I think, 
maybe uh, one, one fourth or one third Indian in, by blood. Uh, the rest was mixed. She was a kind of a Creole. But she was a convert to Christianity. And as you know, converts to Christianity are often far more fanatical about their religion, their new religion, than the established religionists because, you know, they have to justify their conversion. So she harassed her husband, Duplex, until he would agree to implement the order, which eventually happened. And, and in September 1748, we have this testimony, which I'll read quickly. This morning, tents were pitched round St. Paul's Church, and 200 soldiers and 100 sepoys, sepoys were the Indian soldiers employed by the colonial masters were quartered there, and priests were told that the Ishwaran temple would be demolished. The next day, news was brought that Father Kurdu, the superior of St. Paul's Church, had kicked the inner shrine with his foot. The inner shrine is where, of course, the linga was uh, preserved, and ordered the Christians to break the Vahanams. Then Father Kurdu of Karikal came with a great hammer, kicked the lingam, broke it with his hammer, and ordered the kofris. Kofri is a distortion of the word kafir. Kafir is an Arabic word which in Islam means infidel, and is still used that way today. But the Europeans kind of, I mean, the word has a complex history and ended up meaning the pagans, the, again, once again, the non-Christians. So uh, ordered the natives, in other words, and the Europeans to break the him but that would be the, con the converted natives, and the Europeans to break the images of Vishnu and the other gods. Madame, that is to say Madame Duplex, the wife of the governor, went and told the priest that he might break the idols as he pleased. He answered that she had accomplished what had been impossible for 50 years. This is the time that the governors resisted. So you see that there are many aspects to you know, the, uh, the colonial presence uh, in India. And somebody who can be on one side a very good scholar and student of India, and is mostly remembered for that, can also have a fairly destructive role. Now I move on to Anquetil du Perron. Abraham Yassant has his, are his first, first names. So he is known as Anquetil du Perron. And uh, this was one of the very major, not only travelers to India, but Indologists. He's considered in a way as the father of, India, of, of, of Indology, of French Indology. He's the one who gave the example of how we should study another civilization, another culture, and did very solid work. Um, he is the son of. He was the son of a spice importer, and perhaps that is what already connected him to distant lands. First of all, studied Christian theology, had a vague notion of becoming a priest, but then turned to study of languages. And uh, in a short time, he mastered Latin, Greek, Hebrew, and Arabic, uh, which is going to be useful to him. But decided to travel to distant India to find the truth about the Vedas and the Avesta. What is the Avesta? Somebody knows what the Avesta is? The Persian sacred text, yes. So, um, which in many ways resembles the Veda, the Rig Veda in particular. Anyway, so uh, there was a kind of, there were lots of controversies in those days involving British and French scholars. And as you know, the British and the French had been rivals in many fields, political, of course, but also the fields of scholarship for centuries altogether. So he thought, let me try to get it all before the British do. I mean, to put it simply, uh, this was the, you know, the incentive. So he traveled to India at the age of 20, 20 precisely and uh, reached, uh, uh, the, the, um, uh, reached as a common soldier 
for the French East India Company. But very soon, uh, his scholarship and his, you know, uh, uh, the, the activity he wanted to have in India was acknowledged, and uh, he was given facilities as a scholar. However, this was the time when the Anglo-French wars were raging, especially, uh, you know, for the dominance of the the south, the, the, the la large parts of the south and of Bengal, and uh, mostly the French lost most of the time. They could, as you well know, they could only preserve the French colonies uh, uh, in Pondicherry, Chandanagar, Mahé in, in Kerala, uh, Karaikal uh, south of Pondicherry, and Yanaum in Andhra Pradesh. That's about it. So because of the wars, he could not have access to the, uh, the cities he wanted to visit, in particular Varanasi. He was hoping in Varanasi to get the Vedas. And uh, then he, that had to be abandoned. So he refocused his goal exclusively on the Avesta. And he was told that for, to get the Avesta, the proper region was either Mumbai, Bombay, or Surat in Gujarat because that is, of course, where the Parsi community lived. And as you know, the Parsi communities came to India as refugees right from the 8th century onward. They came in several waves. Until they were, they came from Iran mostly, a little bit Afghanistan also, and until they were completely annihilated in Iran. There's only a, a highly symbolic and minuscule community left in Iran. And, uh, but they came with their sacred texts and with their rituals and they preserved all that. So it took him a very long time. It's a long story and very adventurous. Uh, uh, all these uh, people were very courageous and they didn't mind braving uh, the elements, braving the wars, braving uh, the unexpected. And he finally found some, now the, the last obstacle beyond all that was to brave the reluctance of the Indian scholars or those who had the manuscripts. Because most of, most of the time, they saw those foreigners come to them, uh, greedy at times to get, you know, uh, to get hold of those manuscripts in a short time. And they would wonder, why should I give them? You know, these are sacred things for the, for the, for the, the priest who keeps them. Why should he give them to a visiting European? So it would take a little bit of time and tact and convincing, you know, to, and sometimes a little money also, which could help in some cases, to get hold of these manuscripts, which he did in the case of the Avesta eventually, deposited them back in Paris in 1762, and a decade later published for the first time in Europe a translation of most of the Avesta. That translation was received with great skepticism. And the rivalry with the British uh, scholars who felt almost you know, cheated, uh, th this rivalry intensified rather than abated. And one man, the same William Jones, whom I mentioned earlier, published a very scathing letter in high-flown French because he wanted to show uh, you know, how good he was at languages, and he was extremely good at languages. Uh, so he wrote a, a, a long letter in high-flown French to prove that the Avesta published by Anquetil du Perron was a fake document. It was not. Jones was wrong. It was a genuine document, but it was not complete. It was not a bit mixed up, not properly edited, because this was the very first. So later on, of course, more manuscripts were, as always, were collected, collated, edited. And uh, if in French alone, I think we have another two major translations of the Avesta, of the ancient Iranians. And uh, now I'm going to read <coughs> Couple of translations from Anquetil du Perron. Uh, in my own translation, and you will see the different tone altogether. He says, Peaceful Indians, did the rumor of your riches have to penetrate a clime in which artificial needs know no bounds? What is this? 
climb he's talking about, in which artificial knees know no bounds. What is he talking about? What is that? Yeah, but what is he talking about? Who? Who is he talking about? Where is that climb? Remember Voltaire calling the European colonizers barbarians? This is the same. He's just talking about Europe in the colonial times. Soon, new foreigners reach your shores, inconvenient guests. Everything they touched belonged to them. It was not enough that they should invade your commerce, make the price of foodstuffs and goods triple, alter their quality. Your factory is almost wiped out. The workers taking refuge in the mountains, a dying son asking his father what harm he did to those foreigners who have taken the bread out of his mouth. Nothing touches or softens their hearts. Your gold. The Peruvians and Mexicans were told. Now he's switching to the story of the conquest of the Americas. And he uses this as a parallel with the Indian story. Here, the revenue of Hindustan is what we demand, even if for that, streams of blood have to flow. At least, unfortunate Indians, you will perhaps learn that in the space of 200 years, one European who saw you and lived among you has dared to plead your cause and present to the cause of the universe your wounded rights, those of mankind blackened by a vile interest. So, this is, you know, uh, the French is actually much more high flown than this. I had to simplify the language because it can't be rendered in English properly. So what exactly is he alluding to? Not even alluding. It would be perfectly clear to, to anyone. What is he referring to? What is this revenue of Hindustan that he's talking about? No? Yes, Yaram, you wanted to say something? No. He's referring to the ruthless extraction of taxes that the British are beginning to make as they grab region after region. And starting from Bengal in particular, this is known as the Bengal plunder, which was condemned even by some British men at the same period. So the British multiply sometimes a hundredfold the amount of tax that Indian farmers, Indian traders had to pay. And we have lots of documents about this. In fact, when Indians will finally realize what happened, thanks to some books by British scholars like William Digby, or Indian scholars like Dadabai Naroji, like Ramesh Sundar Dutt, when they finally will realize this, was, this will be one of the ingredients that will fuel the nationalist movement, in Bengal in the first decade of the 20th century. The Swadeshi movement, the boycott movement of Bengal in 1905 is partly rooted in the awareness of this plunder. So his, the target of his statement is quite simply the British ruling in India. But there is another reason why he criticizes the British, and it is this. If the British, now he names them, neglect any longer to enrich Europe's scholars with the Sanskrit scriptures, they will bear the shame of having sacrificed honor, probity, and humanity to the vile love for gold and money without human knowledge having derived the least luster, the least growth from their conquests. So what's happening here is that Initially, with a few rare exceptions like William Jones, Wilkins, and a few others, the Asiatic Society of Bengal, basically, the British were not very interested in studying Indian culture or civilization. It was the, the French who did it, a uh, little bit the Portuguese, 
Uh, the Dutch, I cannot say, I, do not, I have not studied Dutch sources very well. So it is only later that the British will start in right earnest collecting manuscripts, sending them to London, getting them studied, getting them compiled, and so on. But 1805, the date of this study, there is still very little scholarly British interest in India. This is what he means. And he says, your reputation is going to be tarnished forever if you do not turn to, to proper you know, study of India. So that's why I said initially that knowledge of India was one, though it was the rarer, the rarer motivation for travelers to come, it still worked at some levels with some of the, tr of the less uh, you know, greedy travelers. Pierre Sonera is another. <coughs> Uh, more or less the same period, slightly later than Anquetil du Perron. Uh, the difference here is that Sonera was already an accomplished naturalist when he left France, with already publications in the study of plants and you know what goes by the name of natural sciences, which includes everything from geology to geography and so on. So he undertook a long travel to many regions, and we see him in, you cannot read the scroll uh, at the bottom right, it reads, Voyage to New Guinea. So he went to many regions of the Pacific, and he was in India from 1774 onward for a few years. And this is one of the first statements he made about India. Ancient India gave to the world its religions and philosophies. Egypt and Greece owe India their wisdom. And it is known that Pythagoras went to India to study under Brahmins, who were the most enlightened of human beings. So how do you view or interpret such a statement? Where would you slot it? How accurate is it? What would you say? Looking at it now, we are almost, uh, uh, we are more than 200 years later. What can we say objectively, quite objectively? Would you agree with, with this statement? Would you disagree? Let me take the case of Egypt. Is it true that Egypt owed its wisdom to India, yes or no, or partly or largely? The answer is no. No. Egypt had its own sources, which actually were very much, pretty much rooted in Egypt. Its civilization began, in fact, even a little before the Indus civilization. But all this they didn't know yet, because the Egyptian hieroglyphs were deciphered only in about 1820 by another French scholar, in fact, as you know, by Champollion, right? So there was a kind of a romantic view of India as the primeval source of it all. Greece, it could be that Greece did receive certain inputs from India, though the channels are somewhat disputed. There have been many uh, scholars showing you know, very close parallels between, for example, some Vedantic concepts uh, in the Upanishads and certain things that Plato, for, among others, uh, um, wrote. But anyway, there are some things, but which, which way exactly things went is, is a bit hard to say. So this is a slightly romanticized view of India as, let us say, the mother of all culture, which is also what Voltaire, in a way, had. And it is due partly to a very imperfect knowledge of India as yet. Number two, it's also due to the fact that, you know, grass is always greener on the other side of the fence. I mean, to put it a bit crudely, they were looking beyond Europe, and they were tired of this Christianity. They were, you know, they didn't find much value in this Bible. This was the age of intellectual rebellion against all of that. And uh, therefore, I mean, India offered a huge opportunity to have such feelings. 
But he also described minutely a lot of monuments, regions, and I stop here at Elora, because Elora, and I should have put a picture of the uh, Kailash, Kailashnath temple of Elora. Uh, I think you, most of you would have heard of it. It is a temple carved out of a hillside. It's a colossal affair. Uh, it's estimated that it was excavated. It is not built, it was not constructed. It was excavated, carved out over many generations, possibly 80 to 100 years. And he visits it and he says, all the excavations we have mentioned, he talks about other cave temples, as well as those of Mahabalipuram, are nothing compared to those of Elora near Dolatabad, 15 leagues from Aurangabad. They offer the most astonishing work man may conceive of. When one carefully examines its caves and temples, the large number of figures and columns carved out of a single rock, one finds it impossible to believe that this was done by human hands. And indeed, there is no workmanship today which could replicate such a monument. Thus, today's people believe that this is the work of jenny, that is to say spirits, one is wonderstruck while examining the details of this magnificent work. And he makes a very interesting statement because this is still the time when Indian texts are not accessible. So he writes, it is certain that a careful study of these works will lead to a perfect knowledge of the ancient Hindu's religion more easily and rapidly than a study of their books would do. So in other words, study Indian architecture and you will understand the religion better. There's a lot to, uh, to, to defend this view. Then we move to another scholar, a very different field now. Don't be frightened by this name. The name is Guillaume Joseph Yassine Jean Baptiste Le Gentil de la Galaisière, but he's just known as Le Gentil. You can see he himself signs his book. Monsieur Le Gentil. So that he is known as such. All the rest are just first names and ennobling appendices. He was an astronomer, a professional astronomer working at the Paris Observatory. And what brought him to India is the transit of Venus in 1769. Anybody knows what the transit of Venus over the sun means? Or what is so special about it? Uh, I don't know the exact date uh, at which it occurs, but uh, there is a period, I guess, once in 80 years, wherein you can see Venus through your naked eye right in front of your, because it appears right in front of the sun. So yeah. it appears as a dot. First of all, it's one once every 200 years. Yeah. And it happened a few years ago. Three, four years ago it happened. Yes. Secondly, it is not once every 200 years. It is twice every 200 years. But at eight years interval, suddenly you have Venus transiting the sun twice in eight years. Then it won't happen again for another 200 years. Thirdly, it's not with the naked eye because your eye will be gone. So don't use your naked eye to watch Venus passing in front of the sun. That's not a good idea. But lastly, this was something that permitted some very important astronomical calculations, especially the notion known as the parallax of the sun. So this means the deviation uh, between the alignments of the Earth, the Sun, Venus, over the ep ecliptic. So these are some, we don't have to be bothered about that, but these are some important astronomical data which this event was able to uh, provide as a, as, a, as a very precise reference. <clears throat> so, Le Gentil, we, we see at that time and therefore, it started in the, first of all, in the late 1850s, 
or, or maybe 1760 was the first event, we see British, French astronomers and astronomers from basically all European nations scattering over the whole globe in the region where the transit is going to be visible. And these are basically the tropical latitudes. So we see them coming to Peru, we see them coming to, uh, uh, to Africa, uh, some go to Madagascar, some go to the uh, Philippines, and some come to India. And unfortunately, Le Gentil was caught again in the context of the Franco, I mean the Anglo-French wars, among others, and he was hoping to be in Madagascar for the first transit, but had to modify his journey, and the first transit occurred when he was actually on the boat, on the ship, at sea. And at sea, he observed the transit, he records that he observed it, but there was no possibility of making any measurement which was the critical input, because you are not, uh, you are not on stable ground. So therefore, he decided for the second one eight years later, he decided not to return to France because, well, that's a long voyage, and he thought he would use the time to study a lot of islands, like Madagascar in particular, Reunion, and, and quite a lot of others, and then land in Pondicherry and study the second transit of Venus in Pondicherry, for which he was very well prepared. The British had lent him a, a telescope from, uh, from the Madras Observatory. And I think the day was 3rd of June. The previous day, there was absolutely clear sky. Early morning also, clear sky. And just as Venus was preparing to pass over the sun's disk, a cloud came over the sun and stayed there for the whole transit of Venus and then moved away so that he could not make any observations. So his two observations were ruined. And um, he was uh, extremely depressed, but he had made a lot of scientific investigations on all these regions and sent a number of memoirs to the French Academy of Sciences, which, are extre which were extremely valuable. And uh, these were published. He returned to France, but with great difficulty, he had to change from ship to ship. Uh, his return was very adventurous. He had to land in Spain, travel overland to France, and finally, when he reached Paris, he found that uh, his, uh, uh, his family had possibly bribed a notary to declare him dead uh, because he had not returned you know, in a certain stipulated period of time, and they had already scattered his, uh, his inheritance. So, and he had also been dismissed from the French Academy of Sciences. So he had to fight for many years to recover all that. Anyway, that's not the point of the story. It's just to tell you that it is adventurous for people to travel all the way to, to a country like um, India. He stayed mostly in Pondicherry. He didn't travel much beyond. But in Pondicherry, he observed the society at close range and passes a lot of very interesting observations. But one of the most interesting one is his interaction with the Indian astrologer. He was an astronomer, remember, and in Europe, astronomers had begun integrating the new calculus of Newton into astronomical calculations. So they were able to do very good calculations for example, of eclipses, how to predict eclipses, how to uh, date them, how to predict the duration, and so on. And he found that this astrologer claimed that he was able to do the same. So that interested him, and he asked him, as an example, to, in front of him, to do all the calculations for the next eclipse of the moon, which this astrologer did with the help of a kind of a board and some quarries, you know, the, the small shells, in a very surprisingly short time. And when Le Gentil checked, cross-checked the calculations with his own methods, he found that they gave exactly the same result. So he was puzzled. 
And this I will say afterwards. And he left a description, and that description is extremely interesting because it is one of the earliest descriptions we have of how traditional Indian astronomers and astrologers were actually calculating. And this is the method which we call today algorithmic. They calculate not with a formula that gives them the result in one go, like today's softwares would, but they calculate through series of operations that yield them, to them to a closer and closer approximation of the result. And these algorithms were set quite a long time ago, initially by Aryabhatta, but refined further by many other astronomers later on. So this is what he says. He says, Brahmanas make the astronomical calculations with a singular speed and ease without pen or pencil, which is surprising for a European. They use instead cowries, kinds of shells, which they align on a board as we do with our counters, or often on the ground. You don't even need a board. This method of calculation seems to be advantageous in that it is swifter and more expeditious than ours. He finds that they can calculate faster. But at the same time, it has a big drawback. There is no way to go back on one's calculations, still less of saving them, since one has to erase them as one proceeds. One operation you do on the board, then you come to the result, memorize it, erase the board, next step in the algorithm, and so on and so forth. So you, if you make a mistake somewhere, you're done for. You have to restart at the beginning. This is a very precise description. If by ill luck one gets the result wrong, one has to start all over again. But they very rarely make mistakes. They work in a singularly composed, untroubled, and calm manner which we Europeans are incapable of and which protects them from the errors we would be unable to avoid in their place. What he doesn't know is that this calm appearance is simply because they have memorized certain formulas. And we know exactly now today what these formulas are in South India at that time. Because these books were published in the 19th century. They were not available in his times. So the calm and composed attitude is simply because they are constantly calling to mind the algorithms, the formulas, uh, which are coded in various ways in what is known as mnemonic methods. That is to say, ways which are easy to remember. And this is why they have to look very calm and composed, because there is a huge amount of mental uh, exercise going on. <clears throat> And it does seem that they and we must keep to our respective methods and that theirs has been uniquely designed for them. Their rules of astronomical and, uh, ast um, calculations involve enigmatic verses which they know by heart. These are the mnemonic techniques which I was telling you. By means of those verses which they can be seen repeating as they go along, as we repeat our formulas and of those cores, they calculate eclipses of the sun and the moon with the greatest speed and with very good accuracy. The tables for the sun and the moon are written on palm leaves cleanly cut to the same size. They assemble them in kinds of booklets which they consult when they want to calculate an eclipse. They use a small stylet or owl you, can you see what he's talking about on those leaves, whatever signs they wish? To trace on those leaves whatever signs they wish. This stylet traces a slight but visible line by tearing the thin film that covers the leaf. This is a very precise description of writing a palm leaf manuscript. So they hold a stylet, not as we hold a pen, but like this in the fist. And with this stylet, the person scratches the upper film of the palm leaf and then spreads, what he doesn't describe here, spreads a black, sorry, a black pigment over the palm leaf, 
which will stay in the scratch area but can be wiped elsewhere. So the result is that you have a, uh, an impression that will remain. So this is the technique for the writing uh, palm leaf manuscripts. But then he also has a few uh, broad remarks on Indian culture and society as he perceived it during his stay in Pondicherry. And he says, let us stop admiring Egypt's pyramids, or at least let us divide our admiration between the works of Indians and those of Egyptians. Once again, these were the two ancient civilizations that you know, Europe was fascinated with at the time. Indians seem to me to be original. And I think the Egyptians only attempted to imitate them. So this is again the same you know, misconception that they had in those days. I doubt there is anywhere else on earth a land where one may live with so much ease as in India, a country that offers so many attractions and charms and with such gentle people at the same time. India is thoroughly magical and enchanting, as it were. Those who set foot here are somehow metamorphosed, if I may use this term. <clears throat> it is a pity that the country should groan under the oppression of the Mughals, an ambitious, fierce, and barbarous nation. What exactly is he trying to say in the last sentence? What do you think? What, what, is, what is in his mind? What has he observed? The Mughal rule in India? Yes, of course. But what prompts him to say that? Why does he perceive the Mughals as ambitious, fierce, and barbarous? Well, maybe because perhaps they were. That's one possible reply. But the reason why, to me, he focuses in his attention to this is because, don't forget that Europe had also militarily confronted Islam in Spain, in Turkey, in different contexts, and they knew that you know, Muslims could be quite a fierce and uh, uh, militarily quite aggressive uh, 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 set of conquerors uh, because they had, I mean, Europe narrowly escaped being conquered uh, in the early medieval period uh, by, by the, the Muslim wave. So I think that he, is, he has this in his memory and he sees the vast majority of Hindus who do appear as passive as uh, you know, uh, more gentle, as he puts it, uh, he makes this contrast because it is, it is very present in his mind uh, as having experienced, uh, you know, the, this uh, fierceness of, of Islam in the European context. Now, Anctil du Perron, as I said, because he focused on India's sacred texts, he seems to have learned a little Sanskrit but what his publications will do anyway is to generate a huge amount of interest in France for Indian texts. So I'm not going to read out this slide. You can just scan it. And, uh, but except for the first item, which is that France will be the first European country to set up a Sanskrit chair in its most prestigious university, the Collège de France in Paris in 1814. And um, <clears throat> this is a time when uh, I think England will take another almost 20 years. Before England, before Britain, Germany will set, will set up the second Sanskrit chair, and the Germans will also be great contributors to Sanskrit studies. And then you can see how following this, we get a lot of translations of Sanskrit texts, and later on, Pali texts, Prakrit texts into French. 
And uh, this, the availability of these texts will have an uh, enormous influence on French thought and literature. I'm just going to give you, to conclude, so in particular, in particular, the Mahabharata and the Ramayana, the two epics. Next to that, perhaps the Gita. Next to that, perhaps the Upanishads. And lastly, the Vedas. The Vedas will not have much influence because they will appear as such an obscure text. And the translation by uh, Long Luan in uh, 1848 will actually be very, very obscure. It's almost in, in intelligible, unintelligible. So this is a bit, this is the order of influence that Indian texts will have. Let me read out to you, for example, this moving testimony by Michelet. Michelet was a very a great, one of the greatest French historians ever, who wrote a monumental 20 volume, if I remember well, a History of France, and including the French Revolution, many volumes. And uh, he turned to reading the Indian texts, as many in his days did. So this is about, um, uh, this is well written in the 1870s or so, and he says, the year 1863 will remain cherished and blessed. It was the first time I could read India's great sacred poem, the divine Ramayana. This great stream of poetry carried away the bitter leaven left by time and purifies us. Whoever has his heart dried up, let him drench it in the Ramayana. Whoever has lost and wept, let him find in it a soothing softness and nature's compassion. Whoever has done too much, willed too much, let him drink a long draught of life and youth from this deep chalice. Everything is narrow in the Occident. Greece is small, I stifle. Judea is dry, I punt. Let me look a little towards lofty Asia, towards the deep Orient. There I find my immense poem, vast as Indian seas, blessed and made golden by the sun, a book of divine harmony in which nothing jars. There reigns a lovable peace, and even in the midst of battle, an infinite softness, an unbounded fraternity extending to all that lives, a bottomless and shoreless ocean of love, piety, clemency. I have found what I was looking for, the Bible of kindness. Great poem, receive me, let me plunge into it, it is the sea of milk. Now that's quite a stunning, what shall I say, not even praise, homage to the epic. Now what you need to know is that Michelet, just like Voltaire, was part of a strong anti-clerical movement in France, opposed to the church in a very, very strong and powerful way. And he was not necessarily an atheist for all that, but he was opposed to established religions in, in Europe and mainly, of course, Christianity. So he's again looking beyond Europe's borders, which he finds narrow and confining. And then suddenly in India, he finds this completely different cultural landscape, cultural values, uh, cultural expression. And uh, therefore, you know, he, he dives into it, as he himself says. So this is the kind of great uh, influence that India will have, especially on the movement, literary movement that Michelet embodied, which is the, move, the romantic movement. Romanticism is, you know, one of the, 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 the important 19th century literary movements, which soon fell out of favor and, you know, gave birth to other movements in French, like the symbolic movement and the realist movement and the surrealist movement and so on and so forth. Uh, we had wave after wave of expressions in poetry, uh, in novels. But very interestingly, I did not go deeper into this because it would require a whole you know, lecture in itself. 
Uh, very interestingly, India impacted French literature in very, in very deep ways, French, French literature. Uh, it impacted the, the, um, um, not only the romantic movement, but also the symbolic movement, pioneered by poets like Mallarmé and Rimbaud in particular, and even to some little extent the, surreal, the surrealist uh, movement. So the influence was very lasting. It was not so important on the philosophical movements, though there, was, there were a few philosophers like Tavernier, for example, who were directly impacted by India. But otherwise, the French philosophical thoughts kind of resisted the Indian influence. Let me end uh, this talk with this French thinker, writer, novelist, statesman, adventurer, Air Force pilot of the 20th century. Can anyone name him by any chance? Because he was also one of the rare, rarer 20th century figures to be very influenced by India. Rarer because in the 20th century, that movement kind of receded for all kinds of reasons, uh, which I will not go into, but India kind of, again, after being very, very present in French and to some extent European thought and literature, uh, it kind of disappeared from the landscape again in the 20th century. So this French, a uh, novelist, he is perhaps truly best known as for his novels, uh, also for his political memoirs, was <coughs> André Malraux. Of course, I can't blame you for not knowing him because I don't know whether many of his works are available. There should be a few that are available in English. Uh, his political memoirs are called anti-memoirs. And uh, uh, they cover several volumes. And India occupy quite a strong presence there, uh, especially for its art and its philosophy. Art, because he was a great art critic. I forgot to mention that. And uh, he was deeply in love with Indian art. He came to India several times, admired Indian architecture, statues. And then the philosophy, he learned enough Sanskrit to read the Gita in the origin. So this was one of, you know, to show you simply how India's influence lingered. And he says, the deepest opposition between the West and India rests on the fact that the fundamental evidence of the West, whether Christian or atheist, please pay attention, is death. Whatever meaning the West gives to it. Whereas India's fundamental evidence in the, is the infinite of life in the infinite of time. Who could kill immortality? Now, this is the kind of very pregnant statements typical of André Malraux. And to read him is, to read him is always a very demanding exercise. First of all, let us, let us spend a few minutes. Why does he say that the fundamental evidence of the West is death? What does he mean? How do you justify such a statement? Any idea? Okay, he, say, he says, whether Christian or atheist, right? So he takes a lot of, there's a lot behind those words. Christian because Christianity is certainly death-centered. In Christianity, as you know, we have one life. And resurrection can happen only after death. And after, you know, this last judgment. So therefore, eternal life, which is the real life, I mean, our life here on this earth may be real, but it's only a passage. 
and it is described in Christianity as a passage. It's a transient, you know, period of time. But the real life, the real thing is the afterlife. So therefore, death. And death also because for Christianity, Jesus' whole meaning happened only at the time of his death. Had Jesus died a normal death, his message would have been wholly different. So the death of Jesus as expiation of the sin of men and his re resurrection and so on is the central pillar of Christianity. So all of this lies behind this mention of Christianity in André Malraux's quotation. Then atheism. Why atheism? You might say atheists believe that there is nothing after death. So for them, life is everything, right? What he says is, atheism in any case, yes, in a way, life has to be lived on its own terms, but then it ends. It ends with death, and there's nothing beyond. And therefore, therefore, the limit of atheism is death. You can only do this much during this short time here, and everything is defeated, everything is annihilated by death ultimately. So this is why he says this very pregnant sentence that the fundamental evidence of the West is death. And it will be the same in Islam. Islam and Christianity are no different from this point of view. In Islam, there will be judgment after death. And the real life, eternal life, whether in heaven or in hell, will be after death. So therefore, you might say the mono monotheistic religions are death center. And this is something which was said long before Malraux himself. Now let's turn to India. <clears throat> Why is India's fundamental evidence the infinite of life? What does he mean? What is he referring to? Yes, Bolli? Reincarnation. Reincarnation is one answer, but it's not the only one. It's not the only one. It is, in my view, you have to interpret Malho. You know, it is so compact that such a text is almost like a scripture. You have to really reflect upon it and, and interpret. So in my view, he is referring here to, well, infinite of time. Yes, time is not bounded in the Indian context. Uh, it is sometimes cyclical. Sometimes not cyclical, but still not bounded. Time is bounded in Christianity because you have, you have the creation, Genesis. So that is the beginning of time. Before that, don't even consider. Don't even try to think of what happens before Genesis. It doesn't have any meaning. And then you have the final destruction of the world by God, you know, as prophesized in uh, John's revelation. So you have the two limits. Those limits do not exist in the Indian context. But you have also the infinity of Godhead, of, of the concept of divinity, where God in, you know, the, the, especially in the context of Hinduism, is not limited in any way is not limited in numbers. He or she or it can take as many shapes, you know, as he, she, it wants. Not limited in time, not limited in, in uh, of course, in power, in, in presence, etc., uh, etc. Et so, so this, uh, uh, you know, presence of infinity is something that is uh, quite clear in the Indian context. And lastly, who could kill immortality? What's this, what does this refer to? 
and you have a big crew, the quotation marks. Did you notice the quotation marks? So what is he quoting? You don't know, I should have taken the trouble and I apologize for not doing it, of fishing out the Sanskrit. Perhaps some of you would have recognized. Who says, who could kill immortality? Krishna. Yes, Krishna in the Gita, of course. When Arjuna complains, and I had given you the clue when I told you that Malho had studied closely the Gita. When Arjuna complains that he doesn't want to kill all his cousins, as part of Krishna's long reply is the fact that these people are already dead. They have already been killed by me. But it's only their bodies. The soul, the Atman, cannot be killed. It is immortal. And who can kill immortality? So you see how compact, very compactly, Malho has brought suddenly a contrast between those two cultures. And that kind of contrast has to be kept in mind when you study the you know, different cultural backgrounds that travelers to India belong to. And of course, different between European culture and Indian culture. That's, of course, the most striking part. But also among the travelers, between their respective cultures. And if you read objectively the British travelers, and there are quite a few counts of them, uh, some of which were published also in the, uh, uh, the same 18th century, and you compare with the French travelers, by and large, you will find that the French travelers show more empathy towards India. They are less disparaging of Indian culture, for example, or Indian religion or customs. Uh, unless, of course, they are Jesuits. If they are Jesuits, if they are missionaries, then they will end up disparaging Hinduism in particular, because unless they portray it as a barbaric primitive religion, then they have no ground to, you know, attempt conversions. So, so this is the kind of, uh, but you do feel a certain empathy, a certain sympathy for Indian, uh, Indians, first of all, Indian concept, uh, Indian society even, the way Indian re Indians relate among themselves. And this is much stronger among the French travelers than among the British. And one reason for that may be cultural, another also is political. Political because the French lost the, you know, the war for India. So therefore, they sometimes, I won't say exactly say take revenge, but they are led to looking at India with much more, through much more sympathetic eyes uh, than the British did as, as masters. Hmm? So this is, um, uh, broadly, this is what I wanted to convey to you. There are many more travelers. There would be, uh, in fact, there's a very big literature. Unfortunately, only a small part of which is available in English. And um, it does show us some insights into Indian society and some aspects of it. Uh, uh, very rich uh, uh, testimonies that the French travelers have left uh, for us to study. Thank you.